أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء الكريم وصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير to everybody joining us online from home inshallah in safety we're coming to you live from the Memphis Islamic Center today on behalf of the Memphis Muslim Medical Clinic we have an expert panel of physicians who have taken care of COVID patients or suspected COVID patients. And we will talk to you, inshallah, today about updates. This is an update to our presentations that we did on behalf of the Muslim Clinic in February at all of the masajid here in Memphis, inshallah. So to cut it short, we have three physicians here besides myself. We have Dr. Ghalib Manan. He's an infectious disease specialist. He's been practicing since 2001 in infectious diseases. We have Dr. Umar Farooq. He's also an emergency physician who's on the front lines, and he's been practicing since 2007 here in Memphis. And we have Dr. Zaman, Dr. Muhammad Zaman. He is a pulmonary and critical care physician and also a sleep specialist. And uh, he's a professor at University of Tennessee Health Science Center and chief of pulmonary and sleep medicine at the VA in Memphis, and he has been practicing for over 30 years in Memphis as well. And I am a, in, still in training, but I have done internal medicine and I'm in nephrology training, and I've also been taking care of some COVID patients. So without further ado, we're going to start with Dr. Manan first. He'll give you some update on the statistics and epidemiology of the cases, who the patients are, and what do we expect in terms of demographics. Then Dr. Farouk will tell you about what to expect when the patients come to the ER, and Dr. Zaman will culminate in speaking about what the care looks like on the inpatient service. Now, I will say, and Dr. Manan is probably going to talk about this, the case count since we last spoke has increased dramatically to over a million cases worldwide. In the United States, we have over 270 cases, 270,000, 270,000 cases since earlier today, and over 32,000 deaths. In Tennessee, we have over 3,000 cases. And in Shelby County, where Memphis is located, we have 640 cases so far. So with this, Dr. Manan. Assalamu alaikum. Zakhullah um, Khairshan for introducing us. And um, basically today, you know, we're gonna talk about um, where we are right now in the COVID-19, or in medical terms, it's referred to as SARS coronavirus 2, a, a virus um, epidemic. It's actually a pandemic. Um, as Sean mentioned, some of the numbers, um, they're pretty st staggering. Um, back in, uh, back in um, our first case in the USA was January 20th. That was the first diagnosis. Um, and our first death in uh, Washington State was on February tw in 29th, which was just over four weeks ago. And since in four weeks, we have now reached more than 7,000 deaths in the USA, just four weeks. That sh just shows, shows how rapidly things are progressing. Um, even in our local community in Shelby County here in our area, just three weeks ago was our first case on March the 9th. Uh, that was the first case, and as uh, Sean mentioned, we now have 640 confirmed cases and eight deaths in Shelby County alone in the space of three weeks. So this is an extremely contagious virus, much more than the flu. Um, it's really taken everybody completely um, by surprise. It's, it has really brought the world to their knees, uh, both in terms of medical terms as well as economic terms. Basically, all the countries in the world are shut down economically at this time. Um, I just want to mention a little bit, very briefly, about where we are right now and where we might be heading, and just very briefly about the transmission and prevention, which is part of the epidemiology. Um, now, what it is is that um, you probably have seen it many times uh, on, on television is that this epidemic is, like, like most epidemics, it's bell-shaped curve. It's a bell-shaped curve, which means that it rises r rapidly, it reaches a peak, and then it comes down again um, over a period of time. Um, that peak is when we have the maximum number of cases 
and the maximum number of deaths. Many other countries in the world have already you know, gone past their peak and now are on the downside. China, for example, and many of the countries on the eastern side. Europe, Italy, Spain, many of them are starting to go past that peak and we are actually are still on the up, upward slope of that curve. So we have not yet reached that peak. In fact, things are getting worse every day as we speak. In fact, today was the highest number of deaths in the USA, almost 1,300 deaths. And the projection is, is that we may not reach our peak for at least another two or three weeks. So the number of deaths is most likely going to continue to rise to a point where it could rise as, as high as 2,300 deaths, that's what the projection is, right when we reach the peak. Um, the, in the best case scenario, we're hoping that once we cross the peak, which will be sometime in the middle of April or towards the end of April, and inshallah, if we can then you know, maintain the, all the recommendations that are given by the CDC, such as social dis distancing, isolation, staying at home, if everyone can per do that perfectly, which is very doubtful, then we're hoping that by end of April and perhaps the beginning of May, we may cross that peak and then gradually go on the down slope. That's the best case scenario. And then as, uh, and we're hoping that we'll come towards the tail end of that peak around the end of May or beginning of June. Again, that's, a, that's when in the best case scenario. So how I'm just going to briefly talk about the transmission. I'm sure you've all heard about it. Um, how is it spread? You know, um, basically, it's, it's spread by respiratory droplets. So when you cough, sneeze, and nowadays, and now recently, you've heard that even when you talk, when you talk, or you know, when you talk, or you know, that you can you can actually spread it just by talking. Because if you if you imagine, look at your, if you if you say the letter T or the letter P, put that on your hand, you can feel a jet of air coming from your hand. So so there's always when you talk. There's a jet of air coming out, so you can imagine if there's virus in your throat, you can you can um, you can you can release the virus like that, and that's the that's the basis of what we call asymptomatic spreading. When people don't, 25% of of people are said to be spreading the virus asymptomatically. How are they doing that? Probably simply by talking, you know, um, t talking and spreading the virus. There there are droplets and there are micro droplets. The micro droplets are, are said to hang in the air. For, for several hours, up to three hours, the, the, a recent article in New England, New England Journal uh, showed. The other means of spreading is obviously by touching contaminated surfaces or what we call fomites. And basically, when you cough, you know, the, the, it, the, it re the same article showed that these infected particles can, can the, the virus can stay viable on these, on these, on these uh, surfaces for many days. For example, on cardboard surfaces, it can stay up to a day stainless steel up to two days, and plastics up to three days. So, um, that's, the, that, so th th that's by touching contaminated surfaces and then touching your hand, touching your eyes, you know, it can, it can spread, it can, that's another means of spreading. Um, just briefly about the preventative measure, measures, um, you've been hearing a lot about that and a lot of people are trying to practice that. At an individual level, um, you, social distancing, staying six feet away from each other, because they're saying that the droplets, um, you know, if you stay within six feet, they can't reach you. But, you know, th th there's recent studies which are saying that you can maybe even go even further than that. Um, avoiding gatherings, that's the whole purpose of, of, of nobody being in this masjid right now, is because by, by gatherings, your, 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 the virus can, is, this particular virus is so contagious, can jump easily from person to person to person very, very rapidly, you know. Um, Washing hands because you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, touching your face, you know, touch, you know, that that's one way of doing it. Uh, and now recently, um, the the CDC today, in fact, uh, has recommended uh, using face masks out in the public. Okay, now it doesn't mean use N95s or surgical masks because they're needed by our our frontline workers. We don't want to deplete those, but uh, they can say you can actually use a cloth ma mask, which is not as good as a surgical mask. Uh, or an N95, but it can um, prevent, you know, if, if, you're, if you're sick, it can prevent you from passing it on to the next person. 
And if everybody's wearing it, it's like a double barrier because I'm wearing one, the next person is wearing one, so that the, the virus actually has to go through two, two layers of cloth, so it, it provides a double, double, double uh, barrier in that sense. So um, in, in, in the, in, it's, it's shown to work, for example, in the eastern countries, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and um, Singapore, they have the lowest um, uh, uh, levels of uh, uh, cases there, and they've managed to turn around very quickly. Um, and Czechoslovakia is another example where they've used public ma uh, masks as well, and it seems to have worked very well. At a state level, the, the, the main way to prevent it is testing. Testing, testing, testing. You might have heard that, the expert saying, why do you want to test it? You want to just test like everybody if possible. The reason is, because then you can identify who are the carriers and then isolate them. Because if you don't identify them, those carriers are going to be going around, spreading it to everybody else, and that's how you know, the, the, the case, number of cases increases exponentially. I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Dr. Omar Farouk, who is going to talk more about the, the ER present, presentation of these patients. I've seen patients on the floor, but he's, he's the, the real front uh, front line, uh, front person uh, you know, when, he, the, when the patients first come to the ER, so he's probably more at risk than all of us. So, Brother Farouk. We're setting up the mic, inshallah. Mike. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Ghalib, for the very nice uh, epidemiology and the uh, prevention of uh, this disease. Uh, before I start, I would like uh, to thank the um, MIC, the leadership, uh, for giving us this uh, opportunity to share our experience with the community so that we can um, tell you our experience uh, and then uh, you can uh, get some uh, firsthand knowledge um, regarding the uh, disease process. Uh, I'm going to uh, take it further from the epidemiology uh, to how the, uh, the patients present to the ER. Uh, the most common presentation uh, I'm seeing uh, in the ER uh, is patients mainly present with cough, uh, fever, and shortness of breath. These are the three presentations which uh, are uh, very uh, commonly uh, uh, patients present with, though. I've seen uh, people, uh, patients presenting with uh, diarrhea. I believe 10% uh, of the patients do present with uh, GI uh, symptoms. Um, another um, uh, few symptoms which are uh, talked about are, and th these are the only symptoms, are the uh, loss of uh, taste and the uh, loss of smell. I have not seen those uh, patients presenting with this, but uh, it has been reported that patients uh, do uh, present uh, with these uh, symptoms. So if you have uh, any of these symptoms which I mentioned as cough, fever, and shortness of breath, then you should be concerned. I would suggest that uh, go to your uh, local um, hospital. You don't have to go to the ER just for these uh, symptoms um, alone. You can get tested as uh, Dr. Manan uh, was mentioning, it's extremely important uh, to be tes tested. We have seen that the countries who have done well, namely um, South Korea, uh, Germany, these were, the including Singapore as well, these were the countries which actually uh, did a lot of testing. Though. So if you have any of these symptoms concerning for um, uh, coronavirus, I would uh, suggest please go to the uh, designated facilities. Um, I believe uh, you can go to uh, Baptist Hospital, uh, St. Francis Hospital, Methodist Hospital. Even I have heard that the uh, local clinics like uh, Christ Community Hospitals, and uh, it might be that your uh, primary care physician can even uh, test you for these. So I would uh, suggest that kindly, if you have any of these symptoms, uh, do uh, consult your uh, primary care doctor. Uh, I also want uh, you to know this, that uh, you, if you have these symptoms, you don't necessarily need to come to the uh, ER. 
Uh, ER is mainly for those uh, people who need to be admitted to the hospital. These will be the, uh, the, the, the patients who really cannot uh, breathe. Their oxygen saturations are uh, generally around less than uh, 90 or so, or they have been running um, fever, which we uh, say around um, 100.4 for a few days, and it's not uh, getting uh, better. Those uh, will be the patients who actually should come uh, to the ER. Now, when I see uh, a patient uh, presenting uh, with these uh, symptoms, what we uh, do is we uh, do some uh, blood workup, um, including a chest x-ray. Now, chest x-ray is very really, uh, important. Um, it has, um, I'm sure Dr. Zaman is going to probably talk uh, to you regarding that as well, but very uh, 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 typical presentation, which we call uh, bilateral pneumonia or ground glass um, uh, appearance on the uh, chest x-ray. So if a patient presents with a cough, a fever, shortness of breath, and uh, uh, on chest x-ray, if they have uh, these uh, presentation, then these are the, uh, uh, the patients who might need to be uh, admitted uh, to the hospital though. So uh, if I see someone like this, um, I will probably uh, admit this person. But on the flip side, if someone just has cough, a fever, they are short of breath, but not to that extent. Uh, that patient does not need to be admitted. We will tell them to please uh, go back, stay at home, wait uh, till your uh, COVID test comes back, and then see how you do. If your symptoms do not improve or they get worse, then please come back. Because at this time, the best uh, uh, thing you guys can do is to stay at home, quarantine uh, yourself and take all the uh, necessary uh, measures which you can uh, do. So nothing to be uh, worried about, but, but please uh, do play your part. Uh, I'm gonna go forward uh, from this. So once the person gets admitted, they will be either admitted to either the floor or the ICU, depending upon uh, their uh, presentation. Uh, luckily, um, up till now, at least um, the, at presentation, I'm not uh, seeing that high of an equity, uh, equity. I have not had to intubate anyone just for, because of the uh, acute respiratory distress secondary to COVID yet. Um, I believe we might be uh, two to three weeks behind, uh, but at least uh, from the, the first day up till now, I am seeing that the uh, equity is getting worse, but still, I think we are behind. So um, I'm going to uh, let Dr. Zaman tell you that uh, what happens when the person gets um, admitted uh, to the hospital. Thank you. Go ahead. Dr. Zaman, go ahead. You're on. You're on. That's behind. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulallah. I walked in here uh, after praying Maghrib in the house and kind of felt very strange. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me to be here 14 times a week. And I have not been here for two plus weeks. And every day goes by, we count our days and weeks and look for months and we do not know where is the end. Inshallah, so Allah bring us back to this jama'ah and bring us back to our state of life that we are used to and let us learn from this trial that Allah has placed on us. So I want to take you to a story to start my, uh, my piece. I want to take you to the northwestern part of this country in the state of Washington. It's a small town called Mount Vernon and the time is early in March, March 10th. A group of people came together 60 of them in a uh, rehearsal for a uh, choir music practice. And they gathered and practiced their choir for two hours and they left, 60 of them. Two to three weeks later, 45 of them tested positive for coronavirus. Three of them are in the hospital in life support and two of them has passed away. So I was thinking, how does it relate to our situation? Let me take you to 
the point that we are challenged by information overload. Today, we have so much information out there. So from my point of view, if I hear something, I ask three questions. Is this information factual or is somebody's opinion? Is it a myth or is it a truth? Is it something tainted with bias or is it based on objective scientific evidence? That's my question one whenever we have a piece of information. Then I ask the question, is this information timely? As you heard Dr. Manan, Dr. Farooq, things are changing rapidly, so is the information current, up to date? And I like to look at the back past and look forward and projections that are being put out there, see where we stand, what to expect as we move from spring break to complete closure of our children's school to now Ramadan is just two weeks away, then we have Taraweeh, we have Qiyamul Lail, Iftar congregation, Iftar party, Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fitr. SubhanAllah, we don't know if any of them are as a reality. So in this scenario, we pray in MIC every morning about 40 people, and at Aisha about 60. So 60 people came to that uh, Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church, and 45 got infected, and three of them struggling for their life, and two of them has passed away. We gather here, 60 people at Aisha every night, and if we were to draw an analogy and comparison, and say they were singing, we also do recite Quran, our Quran is recited in high pitch while we give Adhan. So we have a similar situation. You heard Dr. Manan saying just by breathing, and particularly forceful breathing that are uh, associated with singing classical music or songs uh, loudly can generate enough particles, aerosolized particles in the air. And if we are praying next to each other as we do, or if we are sitting together in a, in, a, in, a, in a dinner program or any other social gathering, we run the same risk. So looking back at the decision that the community made and the leadership and our, our, our respected uh, scholars came together and took the lead in letting the masjid be closed until safety returns to us was very wise. Think about this scenario where we could become news for the world, and when the Muslims are involved in such a congregation, just think about the political twist, media twist, and what will be our reality if we are told that Muslims went to masjid and prayed and 60 people came and 45 got infected and they have been uh, spreading infection in the community. So keep this in mind. So the third question I ask is this information relevant? Is it beneficial? So is this beneficial? I just explained to you, yes, it relates to us. They congregated, we congregate. They were singing, we recite Quran, we get together, we give shakes of our hand, the most common method perhaps of transmission after cough and sneezing droplets will be touching hands. And therefore, we also give our hugs to each other. All of them are high risk social contact situation that we need to uh, make sure we understand why we are going through this closure of the masajid and how it might continue for an indefinite period of time until we go to the other, other side of the car and that may be four weeks away, maybe six weeks away, maybe eight weeks away. So let's go to a patient got admitted by Dr. Farooq and I went there to see the patient. Two types of patients are in the hospital. They're divided by acute severe illness and critical illness. About two out of three hospitalized patients will be considered acute severe illness. They will be, uh, they will be admitted in a specialized unit with all the precautions, negative pressure room if possible, all the barrier precautions. And then about a third of them will be admitted to intensive care unit. And so those who will be intensive care unit, they're more critically ill. And about half of them will be on life support. Let me go back to Dr. Farooq's presentation of three symptoms. Fever, cough, shortness of breath. Of these three, if I am to ask you which one is the most ominous, which one is the most severe of the three symptoms, you might be thinking, it is the shortness of breath that will let me know that the virus has taken seed in the lung, the virus is multiplying, pneumonia has developed, and it is often bilateral, 
means both sides of the lung are involved. It can start at the lower part of the lungs, but it tends to progress and involve both sides of the lung. So when you develop shortness of breath, it is a marker that you probably has progressed to not just pneumonia, probably severe pneumonia. And those who are admitted, the oxygen concentration saturation will be low, they'll be given supplemental oxygen, and we watch them basically with supportive care, give them fluid, and we're trying different treatment modalities. Let me mention one thing. This virus was unknown to human beings three and a half months ago. No one knew about it, right? December 2019, maybe the earliest case. Whatever we have learned, whatever we have been uh, practicing is based on three months of experience. HIV, AIDS, was diagnosed 40 years ago. And even today, we are struggling. There is no vaccination for HIV AIDS. Medication for HIV is not curative. It can control and suppress the growth of the virus. So whatever treatment we are trying are based on what we call retrospective observational studies using certain number of patients. They are not well controlled. They are not randomized. They are not scientifically valid to take your uh, take your position to say it has been proven to benefit from it. So whether it's hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. uh, azithromycin, or remdesivir, all of them are undergoing controlled clinical trial, both in Europe, in China, and in this country. So in a matter of four weeks, between two to six weeks time, we'll have more information. Until then, what we do, we give them oxygenation, we give them fluid, we isolate them in a room, we take all the precautions that healthcare workers do not get, in, get infected. When it comes to critical illness, there is a point of time patient cannot breathe anymore. There is no space left in the lung. The lung is fluid, filled with fluid and inflammatory exudation. That oxygenation is critically low. We don't wait. We immediately move forward when that point is reached and we intubate the patient, put on life support. Right now, in every hospital in the city, from Baptist Central Hospital to Methodist to DeSoto and Methodist South and Regional One, the Veterans Hospital, we have several patients on life support. Dr. Sultan Ali is taking care of at least two patients in ICU on life support and there are several of them in the four in the Veterans Hospital. There are so many other physicians in this community, pulmonologists, we have 10 plus of them from the Muslim community, they are in the front line. We have five or so infectious disease specialists we have probably five plus in fact, emergency room physicians. And there are other special specialties from the Muslim community who are in the front line, risking their life, taking a chance, and delivering service to this greater community. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Muslim community can take pride that our community is able to contribute to the care of the most needed ones in this time of crisis. So our goal now is to take questions from you and we'll take turns and I'm gonna turn it to Shan and inshallah we'll go from there. Jazakumullah khair. For all of our panelists, we do have some questions online and please submit questions on the link provided in the description for the YouTube video and in the chat. So the first question that we have is, what can we do to support our healthcare workers? Well, the most important thing is get educated, like you're doing now if you're attending this lecture. The second thing is follow the guidelines from the experts. Social distancing works. Like our physicians here mentioned, in countries where they've done social distancing and stuck to it, and testing, of course, places like South Korea, places like Singapore, you have flattened the curve. That means that bell-shaped curve Dr. Manan was talking about, instead of being a high slope, meaning cases rising really dramatically and quickly, it's starting to plateau and flatten out. And so that'll decrease the number of new cases and try to limit the spread of the virus. An example of that is if you look here, we're kind of limited by camera angles, but we've tried to do some social distancing to be about six feet apart. Even myself, I'm, I'm about six feet apart from these two physicians here and everybody here is about six. So we're taking it seriously. We're doing social distancing ourselves too, alhamdulillah. Um, so doing that. The other thing is washing your hands for at least 20 seconds, um, either with alcohol-based hand sanitizer to wash your hands or if you're going to do it for 20 seconds, warm, warm soapy water when you wash it. 
The next thing, and like Dr. Manan mentioned, is wearing a face covering. You don't necessarily have to wear a surgical mask. If you can, leave the mask for the healthcare providers who actually need to take care of the coronavirus patients. But anything that will cover your face when you go out in public, like they said, will limit the spread of the virus from you when you cough, for example, or you sneeze, and also will decrease the risk, it won't eliminate the risk, but decrease the risk of you get, getting the virus. So, and then of course make dua first, inshallah, that we are able to stay healthy and continue to care for our community, both Muslim and non-Muslim, and continue to provide services that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to provide, inshallah, in this time. Um, the next question is about the expected peak. Uh, the question is, what is the time frame in which we can expect the peak to occur in Tennessee? And I'm going to direct that to Dr. Manan. JazakAllah khair. Based on the, the, the bell-shaped graph that I mentioned earlier and based on some of the projections that have been made by some of the epidemiologists um, you know, around the country, uh, it, it's, it, these, these, these peaks or these uh, graphs have been um, based on the fact that if everybody uh, maintains the, the guidelines or follows the guidelines to perfection, so um, assuming that um, you know, we may not get perfection, but you know, uh, right now that I think uh, out of the country there's about 95% compliance, I think there's only five states now remaining as of today that uh, don't have any stay-at-home orders. Um, hopefully they'll join in. Um, the, the, the peak most likely is expected to be um, around the mid of middle of April to the later part of April. Um, that would also apply even in our area, in the Tennessee area. Approximately we're looking around the same time, uh, the middle of April towards the end of April. That means that during that time you're going to see the maximum number of deaths, maximum number of cases you know, before, you know, we, we start going over the peak and then you'll know that we, we've, we've, we've crossed the peak when the number of new cases goes down and what we call the doubling time goes down. So, for example, um, right now, uh, for example, uh, last week in New York, um, the doubling time was every two days. So every two days, the number of cases was increasing every two days. And then as, as of now, that doubling time has gone up. So that, instead of... The, the, the number of cases doubling every two days, it's, it then went to four days, then six days. So once you know that the doubling time has started to increase gradually, then you know that you've crossed the peak, and the number of new cases have also started to go down, then you know you've crossed the peak, the, the peak and you're, inshallah, on the down, downward side of the slope. So until you see that, you know, uh, and, and even when you're on the downward slope, you have to maintain these social distancing, isolation, stay at home, Unfortunately, there's no shortcuts. You know, this you, you know this is a community effort. Everybody has to pitch in. The next question is one that we kind of already answered. The question is, should everyone wear a mask when they go out for essential needs? And we kind of already answered that. The earlier guidance was not to do that for healthy people, but because the prevalence has increased in the community and to limit the spread amongst people, now the recommendation from the CDC is to wear a face covering. Doesn't necessarily have to be a medical mask. So if you don't have a medical mask at home, don't necessarily go out and buy any because you're gonna be restricting the supply that healthcare workers have when they take care of patients. If you don't have a mask, any sort of face covering when you go out in public will limit some, in some form or fashion the spread of the virus to other people from you and will help you somewhat in decreasing the risk to yourself as well. I hope that answers the question. The next question that we have is a very relevant one, and I'm going to ask Dr. Farouk this question, and it is, if you are a healthcare worker and you're on the front lines, when you come home, how can you keep your family safe? Thank you, Dr. Mullah, for the question. This is a uh, tough uh, question to answer because I go through this uh, every day, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Manan and Dr. Zaman uh, probably go through this. Uh, so you do uh, the best uh, what you can do. What I have seen is uh, some of my colleagues have started doing is uh, that they uh, take uh, their home clothes uh, with them and they take uh, change, take a shower in the hospital 
uh, put on their home clothes and come um, uh, go to their homes. The other thing, uh, what, uh, uh, what I generally do is uh, go to uh, the uh, garage and I have uh, a setup over there. I take everything down, put it in a bag, and then um, just uh, uh, put that in the, uh, 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 in the washer dryer and then go straight to the shower and then go and uh, meet uh, my family and then just pray that Allah uh, keep us uh, safe. So um, as Sean was mentioning, uh, Brother uh, Manan was mentioning, the best thing uh, you can do is one, um, isolation, and then uh, the, all the mayors, uh, what um, uh, the CD has um, recommended, you take those. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Manan will add a little bit. Yeah, I also just uh, to add to what you just said, uh, Brother Farooq, um, also uh, in my house, I've actually uh, isolated myself in, the, in a room so um, uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, I haven't really been able to be with my family for almost two weeks now. Um, uh, every time I go out of my room and go down to the kitchen, I wear a face mask and my family run away from me. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, it, it's, it's been tough because um, uh, I, you don't know if you're an asymptomatic carrier. You see, as I mentioned, 25% of people are asymptomatic carriers. That's where the risk is. So I don't know if I'm an asymptomatic carrier. Our hospital, we've had p p people in our hospital, staff who have, been, who have been infected. Yesterday I saw a patient, I went to, I went to see him as a COVID positive patient. He turned out to be one of the hospital transporters. So um, you just don't know who's, who's a carrier. So I have been in isolation. I have not been, I usually love to pray in congregation with my family. Uh, at least three or four times a day, whenever as much as possible. Mm. I haven't been able to pray with my family for two weeks. It really hurts me. And, and I haven't been able to go to the masjid for all this time. That really is painful. Um, but inshallah, Allah will give us patience. And, uh, and uh, better times will come, inshallah. Inshallah, jazakallah khair. Dr. Zaman also has something to add. And then I have something. Alhamdulillah. I wanted to mention a personal story that I came to know this morning. Uh, I have uh, a large family in New York City. Uh, most of my mother's children live there. I was there as well, came here 29 years ago. I learned that one of my family had one member, young, who works in Manhattan, New York, and the other members are two children, his wife and his parents. And the oldest member of that family is 78 years old. And the youngest member is 13, year, 13 years old. The other child is 15 years old. And so he came in last Thursday, a week before yesterday, and started having some headaches. And then he didn't know what to do. So he waited until another day he developed fever. And then he had a cough. So he went to the local uh, clinic and was tested and sent home. And yesterday, the test came back positive. And in this one week, every member of the family, six members, two senior citizens, oldest is 78, and then we have uh, two middle-aged uh, people and two, two teenagers, are all symptomatic. So go back to what uh, Galib and Omar said, right? You often may say it's redundant. If you are the only member of the family, whether you are a healthcare worker or not, even if you are going out for a, a reason. You might be the source to bring that virus to the family, and you might be the source to bring it to the senior most member of the family and the children, and how much precaution is enough, right? So I don't touch anything with my hand. Door knobs, right? Faucet handles, refrigerator doors, a chest of drawer door, cabinet door. I don't touch anything. I don't touch anything with my hand, right? And even in the house, maintain that six feet. You can. Inside the house, maintain that. Take the dinner to a sofa, and another one goes to the dining table, and someone else goes to the, the family room, right? Keep the distance. Even in the house, the last thing you want to know, a tragic loss of a family member, because you did not take precautions. So may Allah protect my family, protect all of you and others who are in the front line. But please, please do not take it lightly. Follow all the precautions that are due. You cannot do enough. This is a highly, 
highly contagious virus. Think about SARS and MERS. It did not reach anything close to the global outreach this has reached in three months. SARS was present for eight months, 2002, three, a little bit 2004. And then MERS was present in 2012 and came back a little bit in 2018. 7,500 cases of SARS, 700 deaths. MERS had just about 800 cases, about 250 deaths. Percentage of people dying were higher, but the reach of this virus is so rapid and so widespread. Pandemic was the name used, right? Eventually, a month ago. And every country, I have the WHO report printed with me showing the number of cases, number of deaths in every country. So if somebody has a question, wants to know about their home country, I have that information I can provide. Thank you. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Yeah, also, if you want a good resource for looking at a map with coronavirus statistics, Johns Hopkins has an excellent map that's updated in real time or close to real time, and it's very interactive. You can click on your locale, your country, and you can see the case number, the fatality rate, and everything over there. I'll add one more thing. You know, another thing that we do to protect our families is in the farthest room in our house, I put an air mattress there, and that's where I sleep, basically, uh, kind of staying away from everybody, too. Um, there have been a bunch of questions on here, some of them about specific medical questions. I don't know if we're going to address specific, specific case questions necessarily. This is more kind of general advice. Um, one I'll direct to Dr. Manan in just a second, and one I will answer here is, um, this is something Dr. Farouk already answered, but um, if you're feeling symptomatic, what should you do? So if you have, if you've been in contact with somebody with COVID, or if you're feeling like you're getting a cough, fever, not at the point of having shortness of breath, then don't go directly to your PCP. Call, if you have a primary care doctor, call them first so that they're ready for you because you don't want to go to their office and have a room full of patients and you're coughing and you're spreading the virus amongst those patients. That's one thing. The other thing is they might tell you to go to the ER or like Dr. Farouk was mentioning, there are drive-through testing facilities present in Memphis. Church Health Center and Christ Community Health Services, they've got drive-through testing centers set up in different parts of the city. The University of Tennessee Health Science Center also has a, a drive-through testing facility that's free. It's no charge. It's located at the Liberty Bowl, Tiger Lane. The place, If for those of you who live in Memphis where we prayed the, the last Eid prayer, the Ladha, that area, in that area of town in the fairgrounds. Um, and so the question that I'm going to direct to Dr. Manan is twofold. One, or I guess threefold. One is, um, does the weather have any effect on the virus? The second question, part of the question is, um, are there any, is the virus expected to mutate right now? Which I would say we don't have enough time or data to suggest that, but I'm going to let Dr. Manan answer that. And then the, the third thing is, um, once you have, if you get the virus and you have the disease, are you immune to it, and do you still need to practice social distancing? So three, three part question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Very, uh, very uh, good questions, and uh, they're very common questions as well. So talking about the weather first, um, there's been a lot of hope that, you know, once the weather warms up, perhaps uh, things, the spread of the virus will slow down because there are other types of coronaviruses um, which um, have uh, been less efficient in, in going from person to person in warmer weather. Uh, they say that the, because the, 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 the virus itself is a little bit more unstable um, and um, it, it, just, uh, it just tends to uh, tra uh, transmit better in in dry, cooler weather. But so far, around the world, we have not really seen that uh, because if you look at uh, all the week, we've just come out of our winter. Um, play, other places in the world, such as Australia and Singapore, you know, they're, they're actually going through their summer. It was warm weather, but they, they've had a lot of cases. They've had deaths so there. So, 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 you know, and, and, and we are actually going through a warm, slightly, not summer weather. We're going through our spring right now. Yet we are having the maximum number of deaths right now, uh, and we st and we're still going to expect to uh, have our peak uh, later in the, in the, in, the, in April. So so far, it does not seem to have had much effect on the spread. Um, the second one, what was the second? Mutation. Oh, the mutation. 
Well, uh, there, there have been some very um, um, uh, you know, isolated studies on, on the, the, the mutation because people are obviously trying to uh, make b vaccines and one of the things that have come, come, come out, uh, that's come out of these, um, you know, these very uh, few studies is that so far it seems that the virus does not mutate as much as, for example, the flu virus. And that's why in the flu virus you, you need a new vaccine every year. <coughs> so that is encouraging. If it stays that way and it's true that the, at the, that the virus, I mean, they, they've seen maybe two or three mutations since the very original virus. Um, but other than that, it, so far it has not mutated much which would actually be very good because th in, that means that if you got a vaccine, then that vaccine would be effective long term. Um, unlike the flu, flu virus, which mutates every year, so you need a new flu vaccine every single year. Um, so we don't know whether that will change with time, but you know, we'll have more information. Uh, and um, the last one was? Once you get the disease, are you immune to it? Are you immune, you yes. Um, so, so right now, um, we don't know for sure, but uh, whether once you become infected that you will become Im immune, the chances are that you will, uh, based on the experience with all the other viruses that we have. So if, for, for one specific virus that you get infected with, most of the time, almost 99% of the time, you do become immune to it. Uh, most likely that's gonna be the same case over here. Um, the question is, how long does the immunity last? We don't know that because this is a new virus. Does it last for just a few months or is it last for a lifetime? That's something that time will tell. For example, in the measles, um, the measles virus, for example, we thought that you know, once, you, once you got the infection or the vaccination, you'd be immune for life. But as you know, in the last few years, we've had a lot of measles outbreaks in, in the country. So it seems as though in that case, the immunity has waned over time. So we don't know whether the immunity, we think that the, at least in the short term, you'll have immunity. But w whether that lasts in the long term, we don't know yet. We hope it will. Jazakallah khair. So we have a lot of questions. Jazakallah khair to everybody asking the questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, inshallah. So um, uh, one, uh, one question that somebody asked was, is it okay to go outside and exercise or take a walk? I'm going to say that that depends on your local government regulations, right? So some governments, the majority of governments in the United States, state and local governments have some sort of limitation on when you can go out and what you can do when you go out in terms of essential activities, including going out for groceries, going to the doctor, the pharmacist, pharmacy, things like that. Some jurisdictions have said that you can go out and maintaining social distance in your neighborhood and walk or run or exercise or bike outside. You can also do that in your backyard, of course, if you have a backyard. But I would say look at your local guidelines, look at your local state and county and city laws and go according to that. Because you want to kind of go and not violate those laws. Um, one question that I'm going to direct to Dr. Zaman is, and this was kind of addressed yesterday by the sheikh and the pediatrician who spoke yesterday. But essentially the question is, what is the effect of the virus on children? Do, are they more or less likely to get it? Do they have more severe disease or mild disease? Or are they more at risk of being asymptomatic carriers? What, what does it look like in children? Alhamdulillah, it's a good question. We have addressed this. Uh, you have heard about it. The children go, don't get as much sick but they can transmit. Children are called super spreaders. They're active, they jump around, run around, they, they hug you, they kiss you, and they are very, very likely to be the source of the germ in the household. And if you have a senior citizen, like I mentioned, they are likely to do harm as much, if not more probably than others. So children, illness is milder, mortality rate is even lower, Chinese experience and US experience somewhat parallel that it appears that the disease in children, unlike influenza, this is one of the key difference from influenza, that influenza uh, targets extremes of age, the very elderly and the very young died. By the way, 35,000 people have died from influenza this year. So those who are out there, please get flu vaccination annually and protect your children. So our children now are staying two, three weeks in the household. They are getting restless. Backyard is one place you can try to give them something to play, 
house, inside the house, find something creative to do. Our children are looking forward to uh, four months of no education in the formal face-to-face -face physical setting. We are looking at our second week of August, beginning of fall semester. So uh, this is my opportunity to appeal to my uh, brothers and sisters and parents in the Shriok in the community to please bring something that children can be given to use productive use of their time and not waste their time. But children at this time appears to be relatively protected and are not risk of severe disease or mortality, but they surely will spread the disease if they get it. Okay, and then the next question that we have um, is for Dr. Farooq. And the question is, what if you have a family member at home who tested positive for this COVID-19 and you have to, you're the caregiver for that person, what should you do in terms of taking care of them? What type of equipment should you wear? How should you prepare their food or give them their meals, et cetera? So uh, thank you again, a very good question and um, a difficult uh, one because when one of your loved one is uh, sick, um, obviously you just cannot just leave them though. But um, I think uh, as Dr. Manan um, suggested earlier, the, the key is uh, the uh, prevention. I would suggest follow the, the CDC guidelines for that. Make sure that uh, that person stays um, in um, uh, isolation. Uh, maybe um, just uh, uh, put them in one uh, separate room. Make sure that they wear a mask, and then you also uh, wear a mask. And make sure that you always uh, maintain a distance of uh, six feet, as um, recommended. Um, the uh, as far as uh, providing food, I don't think so that there are any restrictions on the kind of the food, though. But again, um, since the the virus can be transmitted by saliva and all that, though, so make sure that uh, their uh, dishes are uh, clean. You can um, uh, use uh, either. Uh, as far as the dishes are clean on regular basis, I guess um, that's the uh, the key, though. Uh, the, the same steps as you would take for um, anyone, I would suggest just just uh, do uh, use your common sense. Just follow the uh, the, the guidelines um, as suggested by the uh, CDC. So, Dr. Manan will add to that. Just quickly, uh, just to add add on to what Dr. Farooq said, as far as um, uh, the the, the uh, household contact, the patient obviously has to be in isolation. Um, the, the, they have to be in isolation for at least seven days from the onset of the symptoms or uh, at least um, um, plus at least three, uh, 72 hours uh, uh, that they have to be without fever for 72 hours. And the person, the, the, person the, the household contact, whether it be the spouse, they also have to be in quarantine, okay? And, and they have to be in quarantine for at least 14 days after the spouse's fever has resolved. Okay, so, so if the spouse's fever um, resolved yesterday, they have to be in quarantine another 14 days from the time that their fever stops. So, so, and, and, and so it's very important. So, so unfortunately, you're, you're both stuck. It's, it's, it's a difficult situation. But, but, but the quarantine, uh, quarantine, by def those who don't understand, the quarantine is, is, is when you've been exposed, but you don't have symptoms. That's when you go in quarantine. Isolation is when you've been infected and then you have to be isolated and, you know, from, the, from, from people who are healthy. So there's a difference between the definition. Quarantine is when, you're, when you've just been exposed and you don't have symptoms. Okay. And then one other thing that I will add, I don't know if this was said or not. One other thing is that um, if possible, try to limit exposure to one person. Caregiver-wise, if you can, one caregiver only so that you don't expose multiple people in the house. Um, there were several different questions here. Oh, okay, so um, one question that I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Zaman in just a minute, but first Dr. Manan again, is uh, people are asking, you know, with, the, with this virus and social distancing, businessing being closed, a lot of restaurants are closed, you can't go in and you can't eat, but they're encouraging you to, if you can, take out, you know, if it's safe to do that, and order food at home, and um, also when you go out and get your groceries, 
So the people are asking, is it, number one, safe to order from restaurants and do takeout that way? And number two, is it uh, what should you do about groceries when you get them uh, right. in terms of sanitizing or cleaning yeah. them? Yes. Um, uh, basically, that's a very common question, and I'll just try to very briefly answer it. When you, yes, you can go out. Obviously, you have to go to groceries to get your supplies. And you, I think uh, you, you, I mean, it, and it's also fine to go out and get a takeout to, uh, to order food. When you do get the, the, the food, uh, best thing is to wipe down the packets. You know, so if you have the, the outside packets, uh, wipe them down with a, with a sanitizer or um, you know, whatever, a cloth or something, wipe it down. Uh, the risk is small, but it's still there. And then after you've wiped it down, make sure you've washed your hands, uh, 20 seconds like was mentioned before. Also with groceries, you know, when you bring them in, you can just wipe them down if you have sanitizer wipes or just wash them, uh, you know, uh, and just the packets. Um, and uh, basically, and any, even if you don't wash them, um, some of them, if you, if you leave them, you know, in the storage for a few days, the virus is going to die anyway. So, but, but, but if you're going to use them immediately, just wipe them down and you should be fine. So, so I wouldn't, uh, that, that, you know, you can't just stay in the house forever. You do have to go out and, you know, get some food and groceries at some point. So it should be fine. Exactly. Um, really quickly, somebody has been asking uh, about a question about the BCG vaccine being effective against COVID. It has nothing to do with COVID. It is used in mostly developing countries for tuberculosis. Um, the next question I'm going to d direct to Dr. Zaman is um, somebody asked a question about, you know, people with pre-existing medical conditions and people who are older than the age of 65, 70. You know, Ramadan is coming up, and we usually do a talk on Ramadan from the Muslim clinic as well in normal circumstances. We might do that again, inshallah. But basically the question is, you know, if you have pre-existing medical conditions like diabetes, kidney disease, lung disease, high blood pressure, immune system is weak, like if you had a transplant on chemotherapy, cancer, um, if you have in, in any of those categories and with the current pandemic going on, or even if we didn't have a pandemic, is it advisable to fast, number one? Um, and number two, you know, what should you do in the event that um, you have, um, if you want to fast? Okay, Alhamdulillah is another very uh, pertinent question. So let me go over the risk factors. Uh, there are about eight uh, risk factors that makes the, the person who is infected with coronavirus at a higher risk of complications, morbidity and mortality. The word morbidity is suffering, mortality is death. Age above 80 years in the Chinese experience, 15% people, 15 out of 100 died, the highest category. Then come diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, about 7 to 10% people with diabetes and heart disease, which include heart failure, coronary artery disease, seems to suffer death. Then comes chronic respiratory disease, about 6% patients with chronic lung disease, like chronic obstructive lung disease, chronic fibrotic lung disease, et cetera, can suffer mortality. Hypertension, about 6% people develop a fatal outcome. Cancer, with or without chemotherapy, about 5 to 6% suffer mortality. The last but not the least, smoking. Smoking significantly increases your risk. A history of smoking significantly increases your risk of complications and fatality with coronavirus infection. So keep those in mind, age above 80, diabetes, heart disease, uh, chronic lung disease, hypertension, cancer, and smoking. I also have a little bit of advice about dietary restriction, and I'll come to Ramadan as quickly as I can. This is uh, from my brother, who is a infectious disease specialist. He gave some advice. So he said, food that can be generally beneficial and protective from any viral disease, flu, coronavirus, oranges, orange juice, lemon, the citrus. Also grapes and berries and apples and green, green leafy vegetables, kale. If you want to go on supplementation, natural is better, what I just mentioned. If you want supplementation, vitamin C, 1,000 milligram twice a day, if you want to write it down. Zinc, 25, 50 milligram daily, thiamine, 100 milligram daily, vitamin D, 2,000 units daily, they can be found in a combination tablet. Yeah, eat a right? balanced diet. 
and inshallah they can help boost your immune system as well as a resistance of the upper respiratory system of from attachment of the virus and invasion into the body so these are some of the advice now ramadan advice i do not think the advice for ramadan will change because of covid right the fiqh ruling will be given by our scholars and i'll leave it to them inshallah they will be online every night but uh, i would not say that unless there is an infection in the house or somebody is suffering from it when obviously quran mentions if you are ill on a journey then you do not fast right so obviously you will not fast if you have the virus in the household or you are infected yourself but if you are not your ruling will be same as without covid uh, in the community or in the household zakallah zakallah khair um few there's lots more questions coming in but um here is another question um one question is can you also get the flu influenza infection if you have covid infection or vice versa the answer is yes there are two different and distinct viruses they're not in the same kind of species or subspecies or genus or uh, family of viruses coronaviruses are beta coronaviridae and um, influenza viruses are in the paramyxoviridae i believe um, you can correct me on that if you like um, and so you can get both. Um, one other thing to add to what Dr. Zaman was saying, somebody asked about what dietary and lifestyle changes you can make. Dr. Zaman kind of already addressed that, but obviously eating a balanced diet, staying healthy, exercising as you can in your house or your backyard or however your social or governmental restrictions allow you to. Um, and then of course, not smoking, anything that will decrease your risk of having lung injury, not smoking, hookah, shisha, anything like that, cigarettes, um, things like that. Um, and another question, let's see, there was another question. There are several different questions here. We talked about that. Ah, in terms of transmission of the virus, so some people are asking about, um, you know, relations with their spouse. And in terms of uh, transmission of the virus, Dr. Manan, as he said before, was that, you know, the virus is transmitted via respiratory droplets. So you cough, you sneeze, you talk, spit flies from your mouth, or your no and you know secretions can come up from your nose when you sneeze, and that's what carries the virus, as far as we know. Now, again, like Dr. Zaman said, we've only known about this virus for three and a half months. So the data on this virus is evolving day to day, hour by hour sometimes, and so we don't know entirely how it's transmitted besides respiratory droplets, but that's what we know so far. But, but, if, but if you're sick, then you should still maintain social distancing from yes. your spouse as well. Yes, because you can still give them the infection via respiratory droplets, even if you, you know, are in close proximity to them. And, okay, so let me pull up some more questions. There was a question about, Dr. Manan, I'll direct this to you. There was a question about personal protective equipment in terms of using gloves, and the type of mask, if any, whether that's cloth or not, that people in the general public should wear. So the question of gloves has written up, uh, has come up, and actually gloves is not good uh, for the public, uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, gloves is specifically better, is, is used for healthcare workers when they're doing one particular task for a long period of time, and after they finish their task, they take it off and they throw it away. The problem is, is that you imagine when you, if you wear gloves and you go to the grocery store, okay, and then you, you touch a, an infected trolley or something, uh, some, some doorknob or something, you then get it on your gloves, and then you, can, you, then you go and you pick out your groceries, you, inf you basically put the virus on, the, on, the, on your, all your groceries, you know, you, everything you touch after that will then get infected. When you take your wallet out, you've infected your wallet, when you, when you hand the cash, you've infected the wire. When you go to your car, the door handle will be infected. So gloves is actually not a good idea uh, for, for the general public to use. It's, it, you, know, you, you think you're protected, but you're actually spreading the infection around, which makes things worse. Best thing is to not wear gloves. When you touch something, you know, use a hand, a hand sanitizer. Use that regularly. And when, or when you've done all your tasks, you know, come back and use hand, san, hand, san, hand sanitizer or wash your hands. Um, so gloves is better for those who are going to be 
doing a single task for a long period of time, then they can just take it off and throw it away. If you, for example, you have a family member that you have to take care of in the house, you know, you have to clean them up or whatever, you can wear gloves uh, in that, that situation, and then when you're done, you throw it away. So gloves is mainly for one, one use only, I mean, for one task use only. But when you do multiple tasks, you're basically just spreading the virus around and making things, the situation worse. So another question is that um, we, we've heard the statistics on how many people are infected and how many people are, have died from this virus so far, but how many people have recovered? So we have over a million infections worldwide, right? And um, approaching 280,000 infections in the United States and um, about over 7,000 in the United States have died, 7,000, and over 50,000 worldwide have died. How many have recovered? Well, um, close to 225,000 as of a few minutes ago. 225,000 people in the world have recovered. So almost 25% of people who have the, who've gotten the infection have recovered so far. And that's kind of what we know. Another question, and I think Dr. Manan already answered this, but it was about what is the difference between quarantine and isolation. And I know Dr. Manan already kind of answered it, but if either Dr. Farouk or Dr. Manan, one of you guys want to restate that, that would be uh, Yeah, Qu quarantine is basically if you, d if you do not have symptoms, okay, but you've been exposed to someone who has an infection, then you put yourself in quarantine and you watch yourself to see whether you develop symptoms. So the standard quarantine time is 14 days because that is the incubation period of the virus. So doing, if you're going to get symptoms, you're going to probably get it within those 14 days. There's some reports where the virus can, can, can actually live longer than that, but majority of, you know, 90%, 95% of symptoms will develop within that 14 days. If you don't develop uh, symptoms without 14 days, you're pretty much scot-free and you should be able to come out of the quarantine. Isolation is when you are actually infected. When you have the infection, then you have to isolate yourself, protect yourself from the healthy people. That is what isolation, you actually have to, you know, shut yourself off, you know, whoever comes in has to wear the PPE, all that. So, so that's, you know, isolation is for those who are infected, quarantine is just for exposed people who are healthy, don't have symptoms yet. Is that clear? Jazakallah khair. Yes, that's quite clear. Um, another question is, and we've kind of already mentioned this, uh, if you have a family member who is in one of, in one of those high-risk categories that Dr. Zaman mentioned, like somebody with cancer or who otherwise whose immune system is weak, if they have kidney disease, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, etc., what can you do to keep them safe? Basically, everything we've recommended today is what you can do to keep them safe. Keep them at home. Please do not let them go outside. And if they're going to go outside, go in your backyard. Don't go out in public. If you absolutely must go out in public, wear a mask. S maintain that social distancing of six feet, two meters. Please follow those advices. And then wash your hands. When you come back home from outside, wash your hands. Disinfect any surfaces that you might have touched before you came inside. Those are the types of things you can do. And we uh, answered that question already. Um, there's a question about therapeutics that I'm going to ask Dr. Zaman. Um, somebody asked a question about potential therapies, and I know you kind of touched on this, Dr. Zaman, but um, somebody asked about uh, hydroxychloroquine, of, of course, which we've heard a lot about in the past week or so, um, and that, you know, even though there's anecdotal data on that right now, there might be some trials going on about that. And um, there's a question about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, do they work? What type of data do we have? And then the other question is, um, does vitamin C help for this? Okay, so again, uh, uh, a very good uh, question. As I said, we do not have the control trial. We have observational studies. I'm going to take opportunity one more time to use this question to bring some perspective to what is at stake, right? In the United States, 2.5% infected people have passed away. Globally, twice as many counting every nation that has reported their statistics, 5.2% have passed away. So this country mortality is about half, 2.5 as opposed to 5.2. So what it means is that 98, 97.5% people will survive given enough time, rest, oxygen therapy, life support with ventilators, hydration, 
uh, preventing infection. So keep that in mind. It's not a lethal disease. Back in 1980, when HIV AIDS came, everybody died. It took 15 years from 1980 to 1995 to have the first effective entry retroviral therapy. And as I say, 40 years later, we have no vaccine and we have no cure. So this disease is highly contagious. It targets elderly people, people with comorbid illnesses, but overall mortality is small. If you're a young person below 40, your risk of death is less than 1%. As I say, if somebody is above 80, it's 15%. I would say this to you as a critical care physician. If you admit 100 uh, patients to intensive care unit with heart attack, pneumonia, stroke, kidney failure, gastrointestinal hemorrhage, I would say 20 of the 100 will die, regardless of COVID. So we see how we're kind of losing our perspective. 15% COVID patient dies, right? Those who are above 80. What do we see without COVID? Just about the same or even more. When you get to 80s, every organ system, every function of organ system is 80 years old, right? So that's one thing to remember. So in terms of treatment, right now supportive treatment is the best treatment. We should wait hydroxychloroquine given to a group of people, take their positive test to negative at a faster rate, right? The viral test that we do with the nasopharyngeal or oral swab was sterilized in about 80% of the patient in the course of a week of giving. So it seems like it has some significant effect. But if you do not take it, you're still going to weather it out, and inshallah, at the end of it, you're going to come out of it, and more likely than not, you will be immune, at least for a while. Most likely, you will be protected from reinfection at least for a while, if not long-term immunity, as Dr. Mannan said before, right? I uh, wanted to talk one more thing quickly on it. You hear this projection that there may be 87,000 people that could die. You also have hard projection about one to two million people in this country could die. So I did this little math before I came here. One percent of U.S. population, which is 350 million, is 3.5 million, right? One percent of this country's population, which is 350 million, is 3.5 million. If 2%, 2.5% people die, that number is 87,500. That's why you're getting that number. So if the infection rate is 1%, you got about 87,000 deaths. If the infection is 3% to the population, which was the rate in Wuhan? Surprisingly, many of you don't know, Wuhan city is a city of 11 million people. And when they were through this difficulty, only 3% people were infected with the virus of an 11 million city. So if we have 3% uh, infection rate, it will be about 220,000 deaths, right? If 10% people get infected, it will be close to a million deaths. If 30% people of this country gets infected, it will be a 2.6 million deaths, and so on and so forth. So these projections are based on how effective your isolation how effective your stay home, right? And clamp down, what they call lockdown. No city has locked down yet, as far as I know, Galib, and Omar, right, in this country. Chinese were very effective. Military style lockdown, right, two months, and they were successful in getting out of the difficulty. So it shows there is a collective responsibility. All of us have something to play on that, right? Yeah. My behavior will affect what happens to my family and my others I come in contact with. So I wanted to start a little longer answer. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Um, the question I th either for Dr. Farooq or Dr. Uh, Manan, um, this, the question is uh, right now we're kind of at the tail end of the flu season and we're starting up in the springtime, at least here in the south in Memphis, we're notorious for having bad allergy seasons here. Um, I'll tell you from experience as a patient and a physician. And essentially, the question is, is there a way to differentiate between influenza infection, flu, the flu, uh, COVID uh, 2019, and seasonal allergies? Well, uh, the, uh, the presentation is uh, sort of uh, similar, though. So sometimes it does become a little bit uh, difficult to uh, differentiate. 
But um, as far as uh, what I'm seeing in the um, ER, uh, less of a flu. I think we are almost at the uh, downward uh, slope of that. But uh, some of the symptoms are uh, similar, which is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fever, uh, body aches, um, a runny nose. Um, so uh, it does become a little bit um, uh, difficult. I remember when we initially started seeing the, uh, these patients, the first test we used to do was do flu. And if the flu is a, te a test, with ju uh, you can get the results within 30 minutes to uh, an hour or so at, mo at most of the places, though. And if you're positive for, for flu, we would not test you for COVID and let you go home because still it's a viral infection or so. So now things are changing. I, th I feel like that at this point, if you have uh, flu-like symptoms, uh, it would be um, the best to uh, check you out for COVID rather than uh, the influenza. I would let Dr. Manan to probably add to yeah, that. Yeah, just add to that. I think um, also, and you mentioned about allergies. With allergies, you don't usually get fever. Yes. You know, that's a key thing. And one of the typical, I mean, those who have had allergies, I know from my personal experience, you also have the sensation of itching. You know, your eyes are itching, your throat is itching. Um, you, you know, so, so you, you know, and you don't have fevers, uh, and uh, you may have a little bit of runny nose, but, um, but fever, cough, sore throat sometimes, you know, that, that, you know peop, uh, th th those are the symptoms that you start worrying about, and obviously shortness of breath, um, um, then you worry about uh, 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 some kind of viral infection, and obviously in, in, in this situation, the, the probability is going to be COVID. We are towards the, we pretty much, we don't see, we're not seeing that much flu at all. Uh, I haven't seen a flu case for many weeks now. Um, so, so I think it's pretty much COVID. If it's fever, cough, um, sore throat, you know, sh shortness of breath, it's COVID until proven otherwise. Another uh, question, and I think I'm going to direct this to either Dr. Manan or Dr. Zaman, whoever wants to take it. Um, the question is, some other countries, like we've mentioned before, South Korea and Singapore, have... Um, been implementing strategies to that have blunted the the curve, the flattened the curve, so to speak. Um, how and I don't know if this is the right form to ask that question because we have no ef effect on policy whatsoever um, right now because um, we don't make the policy. Is um, you know what can can we emulate that model? Is there anything we can learn from that strategy that they had in those two countries? Basically, they, they, what they're doing is pretty much what we've been talking about the whole time here. Um, yep. Mitigation, you know, mitigation is basically flattening the curve. You know, mitigation is basically meaning social distancing, isolation, um, face mask. These are this is all mitigation. You you, you know bring you know bringing down the um, the, the, the 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 virus, uh, the number of cases. Pretty much everything that we've said today, they've been practicing it very very strictly. Um, we have to do that uh, in order to be as successful as them. We have to do that here, although it's difficult here because of the culture is different, the politics is different. Um, you know, so so it's mainly a cultural and and political, social differences that perhaps we're not able to do it as effectively as those countries. Um, China, for example, very authoritarian country. They have pretty much control over uh, their people with an iron hand. Um, so it's much easier to get those uh, measures done over there than it is over here. Exactly. One, uh, another question that somebody asked, and I think the shuyukh in general uh, as a whole have, mashallah, addressed this really well, whether that's here in Memphis or in other cities in the country or if you live overseas for, for the, our brothers and sisters overseas, for them, um, the I guess I can add myself to, you know, I can answer this myself, and also from anybody on the panel, whomever wants to answer, the question is, you know, th this is a time of uncertainty, right? We don't know if we're going to get an infection. That's one thing. The other thing is we don't know how severe it's going to be if we, God forbid, get the infection. And then people are asking about, you know, will they have a job? Will they be able to provide for their family, pay their bills? What's going to happen? There's a lot of uncertainty going on. And there's this element of fear as well that people have, which is a natural thing to have, by the way. And what is kind of the Islamic perspective on this? And how can we kind of address this from an Islamic perspective? Like I said, a lot of shuyukh have already answered this question. But if anybody on the panel would like to answer or add to that, please go ahead. I think, uh, Sean, you mentioned it. We have Sheikh Yasir Fazaka, who is a 
Islamic mental health expert. We are fortunate to have him, very, very insightful, very, very thoughtful, right? I came across two studies that dealt with mental health stress with COVID. Pew Research showed that one third of the lower economic uh, ladder are in a high psychological distress. They describe it high level of psychological distress or by a factor of two compared to people who are kind of financially uh, more solvent. 64% people in this country said that, that we took a very strong mental hit, H-I-T, and 20% said we had a major impact mentally, right, from this anxiety that comes from it, the media, sensationalization, much of it is kind of real truth, but presented in a fearful twist, right? So the news media would like you to be listening to them and, and paying attention to what they're saying and plugging in the TV and other in internet media. But the, as I say in my beginning, every time you hear a story, ask is this really factual or is this somebody's opinion or is myth versus truth? Ask the question, is this current information? Ask the question, is this beneficial? If not, turn it off. And be selective in your media selection. But I will say, inshallah, in coming days, our scholars, Allah has given us a rich uh, assortment of scholars, will be addressing that question. Yeah, inshallah they will. And, and just to kind of words, you know, to hearten, and, and like I said, the shiuk have mentioned this, but there are several ahadith that address uh, pandemics and um, uh, the, the plague, so to speak. Um, you know, for example, the hadith about the Ta'un Amwas that was in Syria during the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. That's one thing you can look at in Sahih Bukhari. Um, it's between Umar, there's a conversation between Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu And you can reference, you can look at that. Also, you know, the Prophet said, um, and this is in Sahih Bukhari, that the person who dies from a plague, they are considered a shaheed. That's one form of hope that we have. Another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Bukhari as well is that um, if you are in a land of plague and you're a mu'min and you are patient and you have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know that nothing will happen except by the will of Allah and you are there sabiran wa rabitan in that land of plague and you survive it, you have the reward of a shaheed as well. So these are things that give hope to us as Muslims and inshallah in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can elevate our ranks and elevate our ranks to that of mu'minin as well. This is a time that we have to reflect and spend time with our family to reflect on the deen, to reflect on the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To see that this thing, this thing that you can only see with an electron microscope has brought the world to its knees. That is the power of Allah. It gives you ample time to reflect on His power, and also to see the mercy and the acts of kindness that we've witnessed amongst people, amongst neighbors. And that's the true spirit of Islam, to reflect on the, the, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow and implement the guidelines according to the Qur'an and Sunnah. And so this, this, we are preoccupied with the virus. We are worried about the safety of our families and of our countries and of our loved ones. But at the same time, we have this opportunity to grow in our deen to grow as Muslims and to present ourselves as the model image for our communities and our families. I think with that, inshallah, we're going to wrap up. Jazakumullah khair for everybody to, for asking the questions. There were very insightful questions and for tuning in to this. Inshallah, in the future, in the next upcoming weeks, inshallah, we'll have an update again from the Memphis Muslim Medical Clinic and our panel of experts. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum Allah khair subhana rabbika subhana kallahu wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik jazakum Allah khair assalamu alaykum